He's coming back. We know. We know it. We know that He's coming back. Come on, let's worship Him. Come on. Have you ever thought the world has lost its way? Yeah. Crazy as it seems. I know it's going to be okay. Okay. It doesn't scare me. It's temporary. Come on. Let's worship him. He's on the way. The way. Keep your head up. He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. Don't you give up. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. When the world gets complicated, keep celebrating. <laughs> Worship him. He's coming back. Come on. Come on. You don't know when he's coming, but he's on his way back. The trump is going to blow. Sky's going to open up. Come on. He's coming for us. Just like he said. Come on. Come on. Let's worship him. Got to get to the hook. Before I go, come on, get ready. One, two, three. Keep your head up. He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. Don't give up. Coming back. Jesus is coming back. When the world gets complicated, keep on celebrating. <laughs> Cause you know, Jesus is coming back. Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. And welcome to Life Center Live Streaming. I'm your host, woo, Bishop Robert Joyce. Thank you so very much for tuning in with us today. If you're watching with Facebook, go ahead, hit tag and share with somebody. If you're watching with YouTube, go ahead and hit subscribe and notification. And if you're with Instagram, hang on in there. We're about to do it. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your anointing. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Spirit of revelation, spirit of truth, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding. Come now upon us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Don't give up. Jesus is coming back. When the world gets complicated, I dare to keep celebrating. Because you know, because he's on his way. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> well, it's offering time here at Life Center Church. Listen, there are several different ways that you can connect with us. You can call us at 248-345-4227. Or you can hit, look down at our description in the donation link. You hit on it, it'll take you to our website. We are lifecenterchurch.com. And there you can follow instructions and it tells you uh, how to give, what forms to fill out. And, uh, uh, you know, again, I'm pushing for us to get to the place where we have automatic giving. Where you ain't got to think about it. It automatically deducts out of your account. Each month you can send your tithes, your offering, your building fund, your love gifts, whatever you name it. That's what it's going to be. Also, you can cash app us at LWTCC for Life Center Church. Or you can cash app us at R E J. O Y C E E for Rejoice Ministries. And every dime you send will be used to advance the kingdom of God. All right? You can also snail, snail mail us at 3128 Walton Boulevard, uh, P.O. Box 221 um, in Rochester Hills, Michigan, 48309. Or you can talk to us at PayPal. One word, we are Life Center Church. Last but not least, you can contact us at Venmo. At Bishop Joyce 2021. We're all about connecting with people, impacting our lives, and changing our culture. Now, as always, I like to give you at least one nugget because we're going to do commun communion today, and, and I got to get all this in with an hour. So it's going to be one quick nugget that I want to share with you. And, and in preparation for communion, you can get your little elements together so that at the end of the service, we can be able to take communion as a family. Now, uh, uh, I want to show you how uh, when a man rejects himself, okay, when there's self-rejection involved, uh, uh, what happens is 
There are financial reproofs from self-rejection. When you reject yourself, there are financial reproofs, okay? And these reproofs will manifest themselves in your marriage or in your significant relationship, all right? All right, so again, I'm gonna give you one of them, all right? When a man's, uh, uh, when we talk about his actions of, are that of inferiority. In other words, when a man fails to understand and accept unchangeable features in himself. There are some features in a man that's unchangeable or in his family. If those features are unchangeable, he develops a deep feelings of inferiority. He suddenly becomes inferiority over these uh, changes that's unchangeable. Okay, there are certain things that's unchangeable. Now, how does this manifest? It manifests in your wife. By how? Uh, the wife becomes insecure. This is how she responds, all right? Uh, his wife needs to admire her husband and to depend upon him for wise and consistent leadership in the marriage and in the family. And when he has this inferiority about himself, his wife becomes insecure. Wow. Isn't that amazing? All right, let's pray concerning your giving. Father God, in Jesus' name, we ask you right now to bless us. Um, bless us today as we are giving. Bless us today as we are listening to the word of God. Bless uh, those who uh, have sent and releasing uh, tithes and offerings um, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We thank you right now. And we declare and announce supernatural doors are open. Um, uh -oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, uh, the Lord Little baby, uh, um, Myla said the other day, open doors. Uh, she's a kid, little bitty baby. She says, open doors. Uh, you said in your word that out of the mouth of babes, uh, you, we shall have perfected praise. So, Father, we announce what you're announcing in heaven, that our doors are open. Father, we thank you for uh, saving us and protecting us from, from uh, uh, satanic operation. In Jesus' my name. We're not going to be uh, uh, taken down by drive-by shooting. We're not going to have accidents uh, that's birth of the devil. We're not going to be caught up in domestic terror or foreign terror. We're not going to uh, be uh, deceived uh, uh, by the devil putting money down, uh, uh, fake fo uh, dollar bills, uh, and people picking them up uh, with uh, chemical dust on them. We're not going to be victimized uh, in Jesus' my name by the strategy of the devil, but we're going to be at the right place the right time protected. We thank you right now uh, that you're going to give us a double portion of your spirit uh, as we take back um, all that the devil has stolen from us. Whatever the devil has stolen, we declare and announce that we're taking it back. Uh, we're going for it. We thank you for reparations in Jesus' my name uh, that you're going to bless us. Uh, we thank you for canceling debt uh, for colleges uh, and students uh, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for, uh, 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 Lord, you, we, we made promises to kids that they go to college and get an education they're going to get good jobs. Lord, we thank you right now that uh, that promise will be fulfilled. Yay and amen. We thank you for, uh, for Social Security. We're praying in all our life. You said we're going to be able to ret uh, retire and relax. I thank you for that being upon my citizen. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. It's going to be okay. okay. It, doesn't it doesn't scare me. There's something better. Something better. Help is on the way. Okay. So keep your head up. <laughs> keep coming back. Don't give up. Listen. I want you to share the link right now in Jesus' name. Take that finger right there. In Jesus' name. Share the link. I, I guarantee you, you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. Okay, listen. Uh, I've been talking over and over about this whole idea of Jesus coming back and, and um, why I believe what I believe. Um, and so today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about Christian 
apologetics. <laughs> Christian <laughs> apologetics. I want you to stare. I want you to dare to sit through it up because I'm going to give you some things that's going to help you um, in your Christian walk as we move forward. It's very interesting here that uh, <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to open up, go straight to the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or meekness and reverence. Isn't that interesting here? We're singing about the return of Jesus Christ. And so there will be individuals that will come to you and ask you. <laughs> Listen to that. That look, look. I want you to put your favor out there for that type of evangelism. All right. Uh, one of the things we're doing now, we're doing a rollout. We're rolling out um, a watch party where friends, family are coming over together and watch uh, the word of God. And then we have questions and answers and, and Socratic uh, uh, discussions going on. So uh, 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 our idea is capitalizing on those individuals that you already know. All right. So. Here we see a command is given by the word of God that all Christians are commanded uh, to be ready <clears throat> to make a defense for the reason of their hope in Christ. <laughs> You've got to be able to make a defense there. The word defense there is an interesting word. Uh, it comes from apologia, apologia uh, which means a speech in defense of what one has done or of truth which one believes. Now, interestingly here, uh, this is both academically and experientially, all right? When it comes to Christianity, uh, there is an academic side and then there is an experiential side. In other words, I have to come to a place where experientially it happens in my life. I don't need to just, what the young folk used to say, I don't need to just talk about it, I need to be about it. Okay, now, now, the formal use of this word is found in Acts chapter 22, verse 1. 22, 1. Brethren and fathers, listen to this word, hear my defense before you now. So we see here uh, this whole idea that uh, uh, Paul was saying about his defense. He was defending what he had to say. We see the same word here in a formal use uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter number nine. 1 Corinthians chapter nine, watch this. My defense to those who examine me in this. So here again, we see this technical word being used, uh, defense. So Paul here is saying you and I should be able to communicate why we believe what we believe, which is what we call apologetics. Now, Peter here, however, uses the word in context of an informal inquiry by a friend or a neighbor. You know, uh, again, I've had people who ask me, uh, why you go to that church? You know, oh, 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 uh, why, why you don't act a certain way? All right. So that's that inquiry that's there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so it's like someone asking, why, why are you a Christian? Okay. To such Peter says uh, that we should be ready to give reasons why we believe what we believe. So uh, in this lesson on uh, Christian apologetics, we're going to examine some of the exit uh, the evidence that exists for placing one's faith in Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. <laughs> now, I'm here to tell you this is an apostolic message. Um, it's designed for the entire body of Christ um, to help them know uh, and be able to respond. Uh, as a chaplain for tw over 25 years, uh, boy, I would 
uh, lay a foundation. Uh, I only have 15 minutes a night, uh, but I was trying to lay a foundation in the lives of those young men so they'd be able to handle the pressure of uh, the fishbowl that comes um, as a Christian on a worldwide platform. Okay, and so apologetics help you understand and believe. All right, now watch this. In so doing, I hope to uh, accomplish two objectives, all right? <clears throat> One, to strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ. Everything that I do is geared towards strengthening our faith in Jesus Christ so that we can run this race. The Bible says uh, uh, it is not given to the swift, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So my job is to help you have a stamina. <laughs> we have the NBA Finals going on right now. Boy, and one of the things that they're talking about it with Steph Curry is his stamina, his ability to play at a high play, a uh, high uh, perform at a high level and move uh, 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 as he continues uh, against the opposition and the strategies that's against him. So you and I have to have stamina so that we can uh, fight the good fight of faith. All right, now, also to help prepare ourselves uh, to be able to do the very thing that Peter told us in 1 Peter 3, 15. Now, also in this lesson, I hope to establish some basics for Christian apologetics that is important for all to realize. I'm, again, my, my goal, my desire, is to lay a foundation. I'm foundational. If we look in the Old Testament, I mean, in, in the Bible, uh, it seems to me, this is just, I can't prove this per se, but in my mind's eye, when people got saved, they took them to an apostle or a prophet, somebody, to lay a foundation in their life. And now other individuals build upon that foundation, but these individuals laid a foundation that you can build. If you lay the right foundation, you can build a building like the Empire State Building. So my desire is to help you by laying basic foundations in uh, your life. Now, uh, <clears throat> the Christian faith is, write this down, is an, intelligent, is an intelligent, rational faith. It's an intelligent, rational faith. When I got saved, uh, I had just left Thomas Cooley Law School and I came to a church and um, when I when I got saved, uh, I brought my brain with me. Okay, right. And so uh, I was not satisfied with the status quo of uh, you know uh, of just certain of, of just the salvational ministry only in terms of okay, I can only get saved one time. Okay, <laughs> every week, uh, you know, uh, I, I just getting salvation only was not enough. And so I understood that Sundays was the primary net that was being thrown out for salvation. So I, I said, okay, I got I to go to Bible study. I got to go to Sunday school. I got to take some additional classes from the local universities uh, in order to uh, satisfy this thirst inside of me. Now, uh, uh, it's uh, an intelligent faith. It appeals to the mind as well as to the heart. If we're going to uh, continue to have an impact in education um, and in uh, um, with our college students and those that are in our master's program, that those that are in PhD programs, uh, then we've got to make sure that we appeal to the mind as well as the heart. See, God expects us to use our mind. If we look at Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, verse 36, uh, Teacher, which is the great commandments in the law? And Jesus said to him, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. So we see here that Christ wants us to utilize our minds. Okay, again, watch this, John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. Now, one of the things that college teaches us is they teach us how to memorize. <laughs> 
You memorize a whole lot of stuff. And so uh, uh, your responsibility is to memorize the word of God. You shall know the truth and the truth shall uh, make you free. All right. So we see here, you have to use your mind. Now, uh, we do not have to commit intellectual suicide in order to have faith. <laughs> you know, I, uh, as a young guy getting saved and going to a lot of um, different small, small, small churches, uh, uh, and sometimes people were saying stuff that didn't make sense. I said, that don't make no sense. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they would say stuff like, you know, listen, believe God by faith and give you a rent. I said, give, a, give my rent? Oh, no, that don't make no sense. I mean, rent, budget. Budget money is rent money. It's budgeted. Now, offering and other stuff, uh, I can work through that. But I'm not giving up my rent money. Where am I going to stay? <laughs> it had to make sense to me. Now, this is important uh, for, as one person said, my heart cannot rejoice in what my mind rejects. Okay. <clears throat> A weak faith then may result, uh, may be a result of the heart trying to believe in something the mind cannot, you know. Um, but the strong faith God requires involves both the mind and the heart. All right, now, so it's important then that we present reasons of why we believe in an intelligent and rational manner. It has to be some rationale. There are some places that, you know, uh, I've gone to, uh, again, again, we're talking about in my young experiences, uh, when I was in a uh, decision-making mode uh, concerning Christ and, the, and the, being a Christian and uh, coming up with my uh, uh, philosophy, Christian philosophy, that some of the things, some of the places I went to, you know, uh, it, it has to make rational sense. Okay. Now we cannot pander to a man's intellectual arrogance, uh, but we must cater to his, watch this, intellectual integrity. This is Paul Little made that uh, statement. <clears throat> Does this mean that we can offer 100% proof? No. But there is virtually nothing of which that we can offer 100% sure. You know, you know, are you 100% sure who your parents are? You know, if we take the DNA, it's probably 99.99.99, but it's not 100%. All right, now watch this. Uh, 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 yet, we can offer a 100% commitment with less than 100% proof, all right? Such as, of course, flying airplane. You know, I don't have 100% uh, 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 proof of why this plane, this tons and tons of, uh, of steel stays up in the air. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why, how, uh, I can get on this plane and it can take me to my destination. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know how to, I don't understand all of that. All right. Yet, uh, we cannot be uh, certain, 100% certain uh, that we will have a safe journey on the airplane. You know, we get on it, we fly, we don't have, uh, 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 we're not sure we're going to, we're going to arrive because we know they fall out of the air, <laughs> but we, we can, we do get on it with uh, a commitment uh, 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 that is going to take me to my destination. But the statistical evidence is strong enough to convince us that we will. There's no guarantee that this airplane is going to make it. There is a chance that it may fall out of the air. But we've read enough and studied enough to believe uh, that if I get on this plane, uh, going to Memphis, Tennessee, that it's going to take me there and I'm gonna get, it's going to take me there safely. Okay. Now, so though we cannot, we may not have 100% uh, uh, certainty of arrival when we step on the plane, but we, when, but when we do step on the plane, we step on it with a 100% commitment. All right. So the question becomes, is there enough evidence or enough proof to make me, 
make a 100% commitment to Christ. All right. That's, that's what I'm trying to do right here. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to get you and I to make a 100% commitment to Christ. <clears throat> now, I believe that there is enough evidence for me to do that. Okay, certainly enough evidence to commit myself 100% for him rather than 100% against him. <laughs> there is a, a no alternative. Either you're for God or you're against God. There is no a neutral ground. In Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 30, he tells us, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters uh, abroad. So there's no uh, middle ground on this thing. <laughs> Either you're for it or you are against it. Jesus then is like an airplane. Either we get on board totally or we get left behind. You don't you don't get on a plane with one feet on on, a, <laughs> on, the, on the dock and another foot hanging out the airplane. No, no, it don't work like that. Either you're going to get on or you're going to get off. All right. I used to tell people, get in, get out, or get run over. <laughs> All right. Now watch this. So to be a Christian, to have Christian faith in is to be, uh, is to have an intelligent, rational faith, you know, an example of this, uh, uh, we will consider in just a moment. Hang on in here. The Christian faith then is a historical, uh, factual faith. Let me say that again. You hear me talk from time to time about the historical Jesus, <laughs> not the mythical. There are some people have a mythical uh, ideology about their uh, uh, religion. No, we don't have a mythical Jesus. We have a historical Jesus. Uh, uh, Christians, uh, 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 Christianity rather, appeals to history and the facts of history, all right? The facts back in Christianity claims uh, are not a special kind of religious fact. Uh, they are the cognitive, uh, informative uh, uh, facts upon which all historical and legal and ordinary decisions are based. This is what uh, uh, Charles Pinnock said. It is, uh, it will be my purpose in future lessons, not necessarily this one, to present historical facts uh, and then demonstrate that Christian interpretation is more logical than any other. So, you know, I hear uh, different religions and some of that stuff is illogical to me. And I said, that don't make no sense. <laughs> you know, uh, it has to be logical. Now, now also, uh, but uh, I, 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 uh, to give you a brief illustration here, Christianity is based upon historical facts. All right. We see that when you look at Luke, I want you to look at it from a historical perspective. Sometimes we're studying the Bible and we're studying it only from a spiritual perspective. But I want you to engage your brain. Look at Luke chapter number two, verse one through five. I want to show you some things here. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar, uh, Caesar Augusta, uh, that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Corinus was governing uh, Syria. So all went to be registered, uh, everyone to his own city. Joseph also up, went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth uh, uh, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of, of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, all of that, I know sometimes uh, those who are, who are trying to get to the spiritual piece of it might skip over it. But I want you to see here that the Bible is dealing with, as Jesus said early, the mind. All right, look at, look at chapter three, verse one and two. And then I'm gonna come back and, 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 uh, and talk about that for a second. Watch this. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of, uh, 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 and, the, and the region of uh, Trachonius, 
uh, and Lystra, uh, <coughs> while Anna and Cephas were high priests, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, what happened? Why did I go through all of that? I want you to see here, notice here, because it's important here, the appeal to time. These are uh, m m things that you can check in on. It gave us a time frame. If I, if, if I would tell you that uh, 25 years from now that I was a chaplain, of the of the pistons and all that and and uh if i begin to give you dates and time you could go back and check the record okay if i told you man yeah i used to be the chaplain of, 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 the, of the los angeles lakers you know well you could check back at date and time and it wouldn't match out <laughs> you know uh, uh and so here we see the bible intentionally puts this so you can have, uh, that uh, you can have, here's an appeal to time and places and people and events that actually existed in history. So when you go back from a, you get, from a non-spiritual academic perspective, you look back and these places were actually there. It's part of history, all right? So the Christian faith, therefore, is a historical faith uh, that appeals to certain facts uh, of, of, of historical occurrences. Now, again, the Bible is not a history book. It's a history book only when it comes to those uh people that those events that are connected with Israel, you know, or connected with the church. Okay, now, it's not a philosophical uh, faith appealing to the philosophies of men, you know. Uh, I had a, a young lady who went to college, and I'm going like, she's going to study religion, I, and, and I asked her what she's studying. Well, I'm studying philosophies of men. I said to myself, you are wasting time, and you're going to come out crazy. You know, and she wasted time and she came out and she slid back because she got caught up in the different philosophies uh, of men, not based upon myth and legend. We don't base, Christianity is not based on some myth and legend, okay? Now, as we consider the evidence of, of the Christian faith, it is also important to bear in mind that Christian faith uh, uh, is an, an object objective faith okay the christian faith is an objective faith in other words uh, it is a faith in an object we have faith in an object and the object is jesus christ of nazareth the historical jesus christ now faith in who he was that is jesus christ the son of god and faith in what he has done. What's that? He rose from the dead on the third day. So notice here, uh, there are some people that get caught up with faith in their faith. No, no. We ain't got no faith in our faith. We got faith in the Son of God. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in what he did. All right, watch this. Uh, uh, it does make a difference what we believe. You know, uh, there's an old cliche, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. That's inconsistent with the Christian faith, okay? <laughs> you know, boo-boo boo -boo can say that, but Christians can't say that, all right? Look at, Roman, uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Listen to what it tells us here. Romans 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, uh, you will be saved. So this, you can't just believe whatever you want. You have to believe what the word says. Now watch this. Here we go. Also in John chapter 8, verse 24, John 8, 24, therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he uh, you will die in your sin. So we again we see uh, uh, that important to note that it's not faith in of itself that's important. Faith by itself is not important. <laughs> but in whom uh, that is the object of our faith is based. Our faith is based 
on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Okay, now, this is another thing I want you to consider. The, uh, that the, the Christian faith is based on principles of truth. Okay, now, such as truth is always open to examination. <laughs> Let me say that again. Truth is always open to examination. All right, now, and so is the Christian faith. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, I want to show you something here. Uh, the scripture says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. All right, so we see here that uh, Peter was, um, he appealed to, to the crowd to examine what they themselves already knew. Examine it. <laughs> and you will see because you already know. All right. So the Christian faith is open to examination. That's why I love when Jesus say, come and see. When people used to ask uh, about the church when I was a when I first started teaching the people about prayer walking and praying and uh, uh, mapping out an area and, and, and standing and claiming it for the Lord, there were people with all kind of ac uh, accusations about all that. And I just said, come and see. Come and see the results of it. Come see the fruit of it. Come test the atmosphere. <laughs> if it's God, it can stand examination. <laughs> all right, now watch this. Also, if you look at Acts chapter 26, verse 24, Acts 26, 24. I want you to see here, Paul here is proclaiming and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, all right? And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, this is Paul saying, uh, but I'm not mad, most noble Festus. Um, but speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom I also speak freely. Know these things, for I am convinced that none of those things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. So we, again, we see here, Paul invites uh, King Agrippa to examine the evidence. <laughs> Christianity, uh, the truth of Christianity is open for examination. Now, it's not like some religions. Some re religions are, uh, 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 is not open to examination. But the Christian faith is open to honest examination. Now, such truth is always open to non-truth, which is falsification. You know, one of the things that we're seeing so much of now in the media is misinformation, disinformation, all those things that are designed to uh, criminalize one group or, uh, or a group of people, you know, and the media will, will put a slant to try to criminalize individuals. And we have to be able to uh, recognize truth um, and fish through uh, the disinformation, eating the meat and spitting out the bones. All right, so watch this. Uh, uh, Christianity is open to examination. All right, now watch this. Uh, that is, it's open to be proven wrong. Prove that God don't speak. To illustrate this, if you don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead, all right, if there are individuals that don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So we ask you to use the evidence that's available and to attempt, if you so desire, to prove it that he wasn't. Do this and then we shall see which interpretation of the facts is more logical, more intelligent and rational. Boy, uh, I don't have time to pull out all the doctors and uh, scientists who tried to disprove Christianity and walk away uh, as one of them today. <laughs> Woo! 
Woo! Now, before I close this lesson, listen, I wish to address at least one question here. If the Christian faith is such an intelligent, um, rational, historical, and factual faith, then why do so many people reject it? That's the question that I want to answer real quick before I shut this down. Uh, I know you got your elements already and you're getting ready to take communion in just a moment. But I want to, I want to, I want to deal with uh, quickly uh, why people reject Christ. You know, as in the days of Christ, it is usually due to one of three reasons. You know, uh, the first reason why they normally reject Christ is ignorance. If we look at John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verse 40. Therefore, many uh, from the crowd, when they heard these sayings, said, this truly is the prophet. Others says, this is the Christ. But some says, will Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was division among the people because of him. Okay, now, so we see here that some rejected Jesus as Christ because they were ignorant of the historical facts concerning his birth. <laughs> Their ignorance caused them to reject Christ had they known the historical facts, they would not have rejected. Now, so many today do for a similar reason, lack of accurate information. The reason why I'm on social media, the reason why I spend hours and hours preaching and praying and prophesying and ministering to people is because of the lack of accurate information. So we take our time. Now I don't. I know sometimes I want to preach and sometimes I want to uh, get uh, into into that whole mode. But I've got to make sure that my people don't perish for the lack of knowledge. So I have to make sure that there is a there is uh, there's accurate information out there. Now, number one, number two, pride. The second reason why people reject Jesus Christ is pride. If we look at it again, John chapter twelve, verse forty-two. John twelve. Verse 42, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, uh, but because of the Pharisees, uh, they did not confess him. We talk about peer pressure. Some of your kids ain't saved uh, because of their friends. <laughs> they don't want what pooking them and they don't want the pressure of it. All right, watch this. At least they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So the second reason why we see people reject Christ is pride. Pride in wanting to be approved by men. Okay. It kept them from confessing Jesus as Christ, as the Messiah. Now, today, many do, want, do not want the ridicule. When you say you are a Christian, there's ridicule. You know, as a, a senior pastor, I've had uh, many of my uh, Caucasian males uh, to join my church. Um, and then after a while, uh, many of them would leave because of the ridicule uh, of having a black pastor. <laughs> I'm going like, I didn't know I was black. I just thought I was Christian. I didn't, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but there was ridicule. You know, there was ridicule about um, uh, the uh, prophecy and praying for people and speaking in tongues. And there was ridicule <laughs> about it. All right. And there was rejection. So uh, um, today, a lot of people don't want to go through the ridicule. They don't want to go through rejection that one might face for following Jesus Christ. OK, now, the third reason is a moral problem. In John chapter 3, verse 19, John 3, 19. Uh, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So we see here again, uh, uh, some reject the evidence because it would mean having to change their lifestyle. <laughs> you know, I got to reject this because if I know this truth, 
then what am I going to do about it? So I've got to reject this because I don't want to change my lifestyle. Today, many people, uh, in an effort to justify their immorality, accept only the evidence which supports theories which allows them to continue in their lifestyle, whatever that lifestyle is, all right? They reject any evidence that would support a doctrine which would condemn their behavior and require a change, all right? So I got to reject that because I don't want to walk in the light that's being presented. So what does it boil down to? It boils down to this. The rejection of Jesus Christ is not so much a problem of the mind as it is of the will, okay? It's not so much as I can't, but I won't, okay? There's enough evidence to convince the honest and sincere seeker, okay? Uh, but there is not enough evidence to force a man against his will when he is determined to reject it. Uh, you know, I've had many of conversations with, with individuals who was determined uh, to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and keep his wife out of the gospel of Jesus Christ because he did not want to change uh, his uh, and their lifestyle. All right, now watch this. And that's what produces in some cases a uh, uh, Nicodemus, tricky Nick, you know, who had to sneak to see Jesus at night. You know, I've got a lot of uh, sneaky disciples <laughs> that are undercover agents uh, that we're trying to work with them underground before they come out of the closet and announce that Jesus is Lord to the glory and honor of God the Father. All right, now, uh, let's close this baby out. Uh, it is with these basics in mind that I shall endeavor to give evidence that warrants faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the son of the living God. I shall not attempt to prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt, for that's not quite possible. But I shall try and show that it's more logical to believe in Jesus than uh, for one not to. You know, we will begin uh, uh, this uh, series of messages uh, uh, to, to examine the evidence that Jesus is uh, the true uh, uh, historical figure, a person who actually lived. That is going to be my goal and that's going to be my objective in Jesus' mighty name. All right, let's pray and prepare our hearts for uh, communion. You know, um, one of the things that I think is so, so very important for us is that we understand how uh, a Christian should approach Christ, um, uh, communion, okay? Uh, communion is one of the things that's so vital to the Christian experience, you know, to have uh, uh, communion, all right? Uh, he's coming back, and one of the uh, celebratory things that we do is communion. <clears throat> Notice what the scripture says uh, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of the wine after supper saying, this is uh, the new covenant between you and I, sealed uh, by the shedding of my blood. <laughs> this, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. We're announcing his death. When we, when, we, when we take these elements, when we take these elements, we are announcing his death until he come again. All right. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. As we come to the communion table, there are three things that uh, we should remember according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received of the Lord, which I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, 
he break it and said, this is my body, which is, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those, uh, verse 29, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment to themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sickly and a number have fallen asleep. So as we approach the table, these are the three things we should be aware of. One, we should look back. We are to participate in communion in remembrance of Christ. Though we must be reverent and must be appreciative of what communion symbolizes, communion also speaks of intimacy and fellowship. And so we look back, we look back to the cross. We remember what Christ accomplished for us and we are reminded of his love for us. You know, as a Father's Day approach, it's so honorable for every now and then for sons and daughters to remember how much their father loved them and his acts of love. Number two, we are to look ahead. The scripture says to do this until he comes again. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. The first time Jesus came to this earth, he came as the suffering servant. The next time he will come as the conquering king. Communion then is an observance to remind us that Jesus will come again. The third thing uh, that we need to get from the communion table is communion is a time to look within. We are to look within and ask the Holy Spirit to show us any areas of our lives that may not be pleasing to God. Verse 28. Once we acknowledge those areas, we are to repent of those sins. This is how we are to be a church spotless and blameless before the Lord. Because each time the Holy Spirit reminds us of a sin, we repent of it and at that way become clean. In your relationship with your significant other, when you are, when you are, when it brought to your mind that you have offended her or you've offended him, mature couples say, baby, I'm sorry, I was not trying to do it. They own it. And so here, when God shows us something that he's not pleased with, own it in Jesus' name. Now, once, uh, once we acknowledge these areas, we are to repent of those sins. To fail to do so then, uh, and then to take part of communion is to eat and drink damnation to yourself. As the King James Version says, uh, uh, it is to eat and drink not honoring the body of Christ. So to come to the communion table, enjoy. Come to the communion table in reverence and come in honesty. If there's something that isn't quite right, this is the time to deal with it. Communion is an ideal time to make a commitment or a recommitment to Jesus Christ. Let us pray for the elements. Father, we thank you right now for this communion time. We thank you for uh, the finished work of Calvary. We thank you for uh, the word of God that you've left for us as a uh, roadmap to bring honor and glory to you. Bless these elements in Jesus' mighty name. Why don't you get your elements in your hand? 
as we prepare, prepare to take it. This bread represents the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Let's partake together. This cup represents the shed blood of Calvary. I love it where it says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament uh, between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Let us partake together, drink ye, all of it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the golden opportunity we have to serve you, to represent you in the earth realm. We thank you for healing, deliverance, salvation, transformation uh, that comes uh, uh, in uh, our relationship with you. That when you paid for uh, you paid for our healing before you paid for our salvation. So, Father, we announce and declare healing and deliverance. Um, we thank you right now for uh, by His stripes we were healed. So every element of sickness be driven out, back and away in Jesus' mighty name. We announce and declare uh, total healing. Total health, body, soul, and spirit in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for breakthrough, breaking forth um, uh, a transformation in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you right now and declare households are blessed in Jesus' name. We declare right now that our health is blessed uh, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you right now that our marriages are blessed uh, in Jesus' mighty name. We announce and declare our businesses uh, are blessed uh, in Jesus' mighty name. We announce and declare our jobs uh, are blessed uh, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for relationships being healed. Uh, father, son, mother, daughter, children, uh, be healed. We thank you for emotional health and physical health. We thank you for our finances being turned around, Lord, and cause your name to be glorified. We thank you for debt being canceled and mortgages being paid and ministries being blessed. We thank you for wisdom now in Jesus' mighty name. Lead us and guide us and direct us as we go forth, glorifying you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so very much for watching. We really appreciate and really value you being a part with us. We ask you uh, 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 if there are any uh, virtual members out there that want to join and be a part of us. Uh, 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 we want you to. We want to welcome you as you join in and become a part of us. We really value and really appreciate your support, your ministry, and we are praying diligent uh, for you. You know, if you put your name, if you send us your information, we'll uh, make sure that we uh, pray for you. I love praying. I have prayer teams uh, on Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, uh, <laughs> Thursday. We got prayer going uh, a lot of times during the course of the week, and we love to include you into that. So again, we, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We value you. Uh, share the link with your friends and your family. And if you desire to be a part of our uh, watch, <clears throat> our watch night, stop and watch uh, rollout. We'll be uh, if you if you um, write your information, send us your information. We'll give you the information to become a part of it. You can have your own party, <laughs> and I'll come visit you. God bless you. Listen, those of you who came in late, don't forget you can go to our uh, description and hit our donation link. It'll take you to our website, wearelifecenterchurch.com, and give, or you can cash out with that LWTCC for Life Center Church, or R E J O Y C E E for Re. Joyce Ministries. I appreciate you. I value you so very much. A man, it's such an honor for you to give me a chance to serve you. I love serving you. I love the opportunity of us coming together around the throne of grace, laying out the word of God, uh, explaining why we believe what we believe, that Jesus is coming back. Crazy as it seems, yeah, I know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. okay.
Thanks for watching. Our help is on the way. Hey. Coming back. No, don't, you give up. don't give up, baby. Man of God. Woman of God. Worshiper. Prayer warriors. Apostles. Bye bye. Prophets. Evangelist teachers. Oh yeah! He coming for us. I love what John P. Key said. He might come today. Bye bye. Keep your head up.